Hi, we continue today in Revelation 17 and finish the chapter of the angelic explanation of the vision that John saw at the beginning. Uh, and as you can see on the right side of the screen, the angelic explanation ends with one line about the woman you saw as the great city, and that will lead into the angelic pronouncement of judgment and will focus on the city Babylon as opposed to the whore and the woman that we see at the beginning here. So let's, to focus that, let's look back at the sequence of disclosures we've been looking at throughout this section. So we saw the angel said to John, I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with seven heads and ten horns. But what we saw was it proceeds in opposite order. First the beast and the seven heads and then the beast and the ten horns and now the waters and finally the woman. So the woman is left to the end. We were wondering why only one verse at the end, and that's because chapter 18 will be all about uh, the fall of Babylon. So it's setting this up by exploring the, the elements that she has power over, the horn, the beast, and the waters. So today the focus is on the waters. And as we look at waters, let's look at water in Revelation. We haven't looked at that before, and I've color-coded it under four categories here. The green is water as sound. Blue is water as a life source. Uh, red is water as the power source, our power of empire, and more specifically gray is the water as the source of death when it turns into blood or becomes bitter. And so we've seen them contending in various ways as we go, but now it's uh, the water as the power source it's in, it's in these three sections here, all with the water that the women is on. Uh, and then we'll hear later the sound of water, but this will turn all the way around just like the war is turned around uh, to water as a gift. And this contrast between water as a power source and the woman in the fall of Babylon and water as a gift of life in New Jerusalem will be one of the countless contrasts we'll see between the portrayal of Babylon and the portrayal of New Jerusalem, about as opposite as they could possibly be. And so in this case, uh, the water that you saw, um, the angel says, where the whore is seated are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. And we've seen that phrase a number of times in Revelation, the so-called fourfold phrase of the multinational, multilingual, multi-ethnic multitude in Revelation. This is the final example of it. And again, these are color-coded. The light purple ones are the positive ones, and the uh, red ones are the negative ones, uh, where they represent um, allegiance to the beast. Uh, or, as we saw last time in 14.6, receive the eternal gospel. Note that in 14.6, that was just two verses before the first announcement of the fall of Babylon in 14.8. And so here, of all the things that Babylon is seated on, we saw that they were mountains and they were kings, and now the waters are peoples, which is to say all the peoples of the various elements of the empire throughout the Mediterranean in the case of Rome are all the multinational, multilinguistic, multi-ethnic multitudes that many empires take throughout the ages, especially water-based empires. Not all empires are water-based. Obviously, the, the Babylonians and the Assyrians um, had rivers for agriculture, but they did not ply the waters out in the Mediterranean. They were too far from that. And classic empires over the ages, like the empire of Genghis Khan or steppe empires, but we know many water-based empires like Britannia, who ruled the waves. We saw that contrast with the picture of Babylon on the waters and Roma on the uh, Roma with the sword, and then but, but, excuse me, Britannia first under the Roman emperor as a victim, and then above the waters as part of Britannia's uh, empire, which is say the British Empire, and so. Waters, applying uh, those waters with boats and ships and, and trade, we'll see, was key to Rome and key to many empires. And one reason this is at the end is in chapter 18, we'll see the focus on the waters, where the ship owners and the seafarers and the merchants at sea lament the fall of Babylon. And so they will be out of all these people whom the waters bring together in trade. And if we were to look at the map of um, Mediterranean and the places of trade, we won't do that right now. We'll look at that more in chapter 18. Uh, we'd see in detail how that lays out a template for Roman Empire in particular. But again, not just about the Roman Empire, but about em water-based empires and the trade they allow. And then we turn back to the ten horns. Interestingly, having one verse on the water, uh, then it turns back to the ten horns. And this verse, of course, has nothing to do with the waters. Um, and 16 and 17 really seem to follow on what went before in the description of the horns. But there's quite a twist. We saw earlier that the, the ten horns representing kings gave their power to the beast for one hour, delegated by God to be the avenging force that will take down uh, Babylon. Uh, but here something else happens. The ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the whore. The very one who is the source of the whore's power will hate her, or it, as we'll see, as it shifts from whore to city. Um, hate, the verb missio, um, it's only one time earlier in Revelation, and it'll be here where Revelation is the, is the haunt for hateful birds. Something to note about the, the word missio in Greek, um, it's
it's not the opposite of love in the sense of emotional uh, ratio um, in a, a spectrum, where love is at one end, hate is the other, and neutrality in the middle, and then there's like and dislike, etc. Uh, hate means completely reject, just as agapo, agapo love means to completely embrace and accept, and um, to accept the other more than oneself, and this is to completely reject. So the beast um, will not necessarily have anger at the whore, but will reject the whore which is one way of John noting the power of what empires do. Just as we see in the Synoptic Gospels, Jesus uses the metaphor, if Satan is divided against himself, how can his kingdom stand? Similarly, the beast is about violence and destruction, and that can serve one's purpose temporarily if you use violence and destruction against somebody whose resources you want, whether that's as slaves, as we'll see it later in chapter 18, or for their goods. Um, but it's an attitude uh, that divides and conquers, and will continue to do that until coalitions come apart and everything is destroyed. The only alternative is God's way of unity, and we'll see that explicitly in the next verse, as we'll, as we'll look at in a moment. So the beast will hate the whore and the kings, um, whether that's, as my note uh, my note has below, whether that's client, we envision that as clients turning against their patron, or colonies turning against their colonizer, or even simply just members of a unwilling, semi-willing alliance finally breaking free, um, perhaps like the uh, Eastern bloc nations after the Soviet Union fell. We can't specify one of those, and perhaps it's all of those. But they will turn against it, and the coalition will come apart. And it's described with two words. words. The new RSV has, they will make her desert, desolate, but it's literally, they will make her a desert or a wilderness and naked, which is to say, we see this as a city, the city will be ruins. Um, and this also echoes the Hebrew scripture elements that we've been noting all along. And as they do, we'll note that I added a couple things. So for the third time, I'm going to repost this on the webpage because I keep adding things to it. Uh, and maybe I'll do it again before chapter 18 is over. And so we saw this quote here um, in what we're looking at in 16. And notice how it bifurcates or quad trifurcates, I suppose, around Ezekiel. First in chapter 23, two images of, uh, from God saying, I will rouse against you your lovers from whom you turned in disgust, and I will bring them against you from every side. And then a few verses later, for thus says Yahweh God, I will deliver you into the hands of those whom you hate, into the hands of those from whom you turned in disgust, and they shall deal with you in hatred. Take away all the fruit of your labor, leave you naked and bare, and the nakedness of your whoring shall be exposed. And of course, that's an expression of what happened when Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians in exile. Um, and then finally we see here, I brought you, I brought out fire from within you, it consumed you, and I turned you into ashes on the earth in the sight of all who saw you. Again, an expression of exile. So those prophetic denunciations of Jerusalem at the time, and of course also of Babylon and other texts, now comes back against uh, Babylon as empire here. Um, this is, of course, where scholars are uh, sensitive, rightly, to the imagery of burning the flesh of a woman and burning her up, you know, shout protests here. But it's important to note a couple of things. Um, the word for make desolate and uh, for uh, devour their flesh here points us uh, forward uh, to another scene. And let's look at that here. The word for sarks, for flesh, is first here, and then it's five times in 1918 and then 1921. So let's look at that for a moment to see the point I'm, I'm making about why the description of uh, devouring a woman's flesh and burning her up isn't necessarily about misogyny. Because here we see, the going back a verse, come gather for the great supper of God to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of the mighty, the flesh of horses and their riders, flesh of all, both free and slave, small and great. So it's a great feast, not just cannibalism, because it includes the horses and other things. But notice, these are all male images, or at least mostly male images, kings and captains and riders, and um, the free and slave are gender neutral, and uh, the horses don't seem to have gender here, and the riders would certainly be uh, generally male. So it's not so much about sexism or misogyny. It's not about hating women as such. It's about everybody who's on the side of empire will be, end up being destroyed unless they repent and come into New Jerusalem, which they continue to have the right to do all the way up to the end. Um, let's look at a couple. We, I skipped over naked and devoured to get back to flesh. Let's look at that here. We saw naked two other times as metaphorical human nakedness, but clearly this is echoing the Ezekiel passages of a city becoming naked through uh, destruction. And note that 
Ezekiel makes the same point I've been making here, is that, uh, that Jerusalem's destruction comes at, as a result of its own activities. Because you played the whore with the nations and polluted yourself with your idols. Your lewdness and your whorings have brought this upon you. So it doesn't even suggest that God is doing it as such. God is allowing uh, this system to play out the uh, dark logic of imperial destruction. And so uh, we'll look more at the image of eating flesh when we look at the Great Supper in chapter 19. Um, but here it's certainly looking for to that destruction of Jerusalem, which we'll see, or Babylon rather, which we'll see named in just a couple of verses. And then it continues here with some interesting things. As a little notes, God simply provokes these powers to be logically, faithfully at the service of this beast who is the destroyer of itself. And again, that's echoing the point I made earlier about Jesus saying, uh, if Satan is divided against Satan, how can his kingdom stand? Let's look a little more closely at this language because there's important things going on here that are hidden a little bit behind the translation. For God has put it into their hearts, a phrase used in John 13 for what God does to Judas, to put it in the heart of Judas to betray him. That's um, a Semitic idiom for putting an idea into them. That doesn't mean they're compelled to do it. It's just an idea. And then they're choosing to do it. Um, so God puts that idea in them to carry out God's purpose. And here it is, uh, Gnomen, the same word we saw in 13, for the one mind of the kings who give their power to the beast. So the issue is the dragon's purpose or God's purpose. And here um, it's God's purpose that overrides. Even though they probably think they're carrying out the purpose of empire, probably not thinking they're carrying out the will of a dragon or a beast, but carrying out the imperial will. But in fact, behind the scenes, the text is telling us they're carrying out the will of the creator God. By, and we see here agreeing meongenomon the same phrase that we saw earlier um and so um it's repeated here to highlight that god is behind it and then an interesting thing to give their kingdom it's a collective singular singular here the opposite is that we saw in 410 of the kingdom was uh, well, i can look back at that so you can see um where um the 24 elders are gathered around god's kingdom and here um, they give their kingdom to the beast, uh, and yet it's God's doing that does that. Notice the collective, their kingdom. So this is a, co a coalition of opponents who are envisioned as one thing. Perhaps we might imagine it like the European Union, one collective entity consisting of a variety of ethnic groups and nations. Uh, until the words of God will be fulfilled. And it's an unusual example of the words of God, plural, as opposed to the word of God, uh, but there it is. And fulfilled here, or literally uh, brought to completion. And we'll see more of that there. And, and so um, we're really seeing a more evidence of the turn from the battle we saw earlier and from 11 to 13 to this coming around in the insurance, assurance of God's victory and the destruction of empire and the beast. And finally, the woman now is said to be the city. And with that, it'll be more the city throughout the, ch the chapter 18. We'll still see imagery of scarlet and purple and still see whore imagery, but it's going to gradually shift here from the image of the whore to the image of the great city. And we've seen the great city before, but as I was just noting, five times in chapter 18. So the woman you saw is the great city. So now we can let go of the idea, if we are still carrying it, this is about any kind of fleshly human person. It is not. It's about the city itself that rules over, uh, or literally, um, he, akuka, um, excuse me, akusa, uh, Asalean, Basalean, there, I left out a letter there, I'm sorry, the one reigning. Um, and so the, the, the city is the one that reigns over the kings of the earth. And what we'll see is that one is fallen, fallen, become a dwelling for all evil things and dark things. And we'll see that next time. Bye-bye.